Welcome to our video on diodes. Uh, we're going to talk about basically how they work and what they're good for. And there's nothing more exciting than that on a Monday morning. Or no, today's Tuesday. Today's Tuesday. Nothing more exciting than on a nothing more exciting than that on a Tuesday morning. Okay. So diodes were discovered in the late 1800s. Basically, the original diodes were natural materials. You'd have a chunk of crystal, and if you probed it in the right places, you could find places where electricity would flow one way and not the other. They were point contact diodes. From there, uh, we went to vacuum tubes. We're not going to spend any time on vacuum tubes. And now they're primarily manufactured from silicon semiconductors and germanium and things like that. So what are semiconductors? There are elements from group four of the periodic table. Um, silicon is very common. Germanium is common. Cadmium sulfide. And they all have similar but different electrical properties. And what we'll do to these is we'll dope them or add an impurity like arsenic or phosphor that will create n-type semiconductors. Uh, those are semiconductors where there is these Doping elements provide additional electrons in the crystal lattice that can carry a charge through that semiconductor material. Now, the net electric charge on the N-type semiconductor is neutral, but it has electrons available from those impurity elements that will let um, current flow easily. We can make P-type semiconductors by doping with other elements, and those give us Essentially, those are elements that have a hole or a missing electron in their outer electron shell. And we refer to that as a hole. And you can look at a hole as a positive charge carrier. Um, as a hole, as electrons move one way through this material, the places where that electron is missing is moving the other way. So we have a little animation here. I have this hole which can accept an electron when an electron moves into that hole. What happens is that electron leaves here, moves there, and then the, the hole moves, moves from over here to over there. Okay? So in the P-type material, we have holes moving one way. In the N-type material, we have electrons moving that way. And in reality, it's all really electrons moving, but um, it's easier to kind of follow along if we think of the holes moving. So what to create a diode, we join a P-type and an N-type semiconductor. And let, let, me, let me illustrate that better. Let's, let's do this. If I have my... P-type that has holes, places where an electron can land, and I have my N-type where I have these extra electrons, or available electrons, I should say. Um, you can see that what's going to happen here is these electrons on over here are going to see these empty spaces over there, and electrons the rolling electron gathers no moss, you know, they'll, they'll tend to migrate. And what that leaves us with is um, you, over here you'll have essentially these holes get filled and I have these places here where I have a missing electron and I have a net positive charge. So I create an electrostatic voltage field here. It's called the, and that's called the barrier region. And as, as those electrons migrate, I have a net negative charge here and a net positive charge there. And as that charge builds up, then that tends to make the electrons not want to migrate anymore because now you have that, uh, they're attracted to the positive charge on the other side. If I hook up, hook this to a negative source on this side and a positive source on this side, I'm going to move electrons 
into there and I'll essentially fill up more holes and I'll take electrons out of the, on the P side, and on the N side I'll be moving electrons out and I'll essentially take, increase the, uh, the width of that barrier region and in fact increase that, that voltage in the barrier region, but we're not going to really flow much electricity other than that initial little little bit, you know. Let me draw this back in its normal state. So that that blocks the flow of current when you have it hooked up this way or reverse bias. Now if I forward bias it, I connect the negative to the end material, the positive to the um, P material or the anode. I should label those two. Anode and now I'm piling electrons into this N material which already has a surplus of electrons and I'm trying to pull them out of the P material. So that's going to cause these electrons to migrate and go on out. They'll migrate, migrate, go on out. And the electrons coming in here can migrate, migrate. And we just start conducting electricity. Um, once we've got, you know, once we've overcome this initial barrier voltage, which for a silicon diode runs about 0.6 volts, typical. So as soon as our voltage gets above 0.6 volts, now those electrons are free to jump that barrier and we get an electron flow through the entire device. And it's faster if I just push an E then it's all gone, isn't it? Okay. So we have our our diode here with the P-type material, the N-type material, they often look like this with a band here, a white band, um, to tell us which way is which, because obviously you have to know which way is which on these things. There is the symbol that you see in a schematic. Um, and again, it's labeled plus and minus. That's for a forward biased um, diode. That's the anode. That's the cathode and it will conduct electricity in from plus to minus in that direction. So if we're forward biased, like, like I, we have it drawn, if this is plus and minus, forward biased, the current will flow. And there's, there's the graph. We'll just, let me get, there we go, okay. So if we're forward biased and this voltage across the diode is, is greater than that, that um, the, the forward bias voltage right here, which is about 0.6 or 0.6 to 0.7. So as long as my voltage, if this is voltage on the x-axis, current on the y-axis, as long as I'm above that threshold, I'll start flowing and my current will go up with very little change in the voltage across it. Okay, so I almost have a constant voltage drop across it independent of the current. And I should also mention it, it's, that 0 0.6, 0 0.7 is for silicon. Uh, germanium diodes can be built with the voltage threshold of 0.3. Schottky diodes can get down to below about 0.1 or 0.2. Reverse bias, if I turn the... the um, if I turn the voltage around and connect this negative, that positive, now we, we're, all we're doing now is reinforcing that depletion region. We're not really flowing any current. So um, if the voltage on the diode is between this forward bias and the Zener voltage, or breakdown voltage, we'll talk about that in a second. So as long as my voltage is in this range from here to here, it doesn't conduct anymore. This is zero, roughly. So at some point, as it turns out, if I bias it hard enough, um, we'll just break everything down inside that, that diode. 
for a normal diode, once I get to this voltage and it starts to conduct, um, essentially we've let the smoke out. Okay, that's it, you're down that diode. But there are other diodes called Zener diodes, which are actually op designed to operate in this region without self-destructing, and they do a good job of, they would be normally hooked up in a, a reverse bias orientation, and as soon as the voltage gets above this threshold, they start conducting, and they're used in voltage regulation applications, and we'll see some of those. So the, some of the practical considerations for diodes is the maximum allowable current through a diode. Remember in our chart, our graph, um, in the forward bias, we had a curve that looked like this. Well, we do have some delta V across the diode all the time. This is voltage, this is current. And if I have some voltage across it and some current flowing, now I have a power equals V times I. So that power essentially has to get dissipated as heat. So V is approximately constant. And so our power or heat is going to be a function of the current, and as current goes up and the thing heats up, everything has its limits, and you can you can um, overheat the diode, and it'll essentially short out and run away. Maximum reverse voltage, again, that VZ, uh, it breaks down. That can be a consideration, um, particularly for diodes that aren't intended to run in that up in that mode, and we can think of a diode as being essentially like a check valve which allows electrons or current to flow in only one direction. So electrons will flow this way but not that way in this diode. Well, actually current flows that way. Electrons, electrons flow from negative to positive but if we stick with our convention that current flows in positive and negative, those arrows for the direction of current, okay? Well, these little details can kill you. Okay, so when a diode is forward biased, if the voltage is larger than that, that uh, forward bias voltage, then the diode can be modeled as a short circuit in series with a battery. So our model essentially looks like this, where we have the diode is replaced with a short circuit, and we insert this battery um, essentially with positive here and negative there. So when we apply Kirchhoff's voltage laws, we go around this loop, we, you know, we have our Vs and we have a minus Vy and a minus Vr over there. So it, it's modeled as a voltage drop in our circuit. And the current does flow. And if the uh, voltage is, is in the if it's rever reversed bias and we haven't gone beyond a breakdown voltage, we essentially just have an output there. So voltage diode is Vs, and this is Vd equals Vs, and this Vr equals zero because there's no current flowing. Okay. So let's look at some applications. One of the things that we commonly do with diodes in one of the very early applications was converting a alternating current into a direct current, or at least a pulsating direct current. Um, this is an example. We have an AC source. I have some load over here, and I have a diode, and this diode here, actually, you know, the diode, um, that performs half-wave rectification. We'll let it do, it will let current flow this way, but not that way. So, well, I've got a nice picture here. So as our voltage source in blue, when it's positive, the current output, the voltage output here, um, is going to be close to that, that um, voltage input. Again, we get our our 0.6 volt drop across the diode. 
And when the voltage goes negative here, our, we essentially have an open circuit, so our V output is zero. So a half-wave rectifier takes us from this blue AC voltage to a pulsating DC voltage across our, our load. So we're, we now have a current that flows in only one direction, which is often useful, but we've thrown away half of our, um, you know, we've thrown away half of our cycle here. A, another way to do it is a bridge rectifier. And let's, this, we're going to have to take some time to draw this. If I have my uh, AC voltage, if this is plus and this is minus, current's going to flow it's going to come to this bridge, it's going to flow through this diode, because that's pointed in the right direction, out into our load, comes back in, and it can flow through this diode right here and back to our source. So we have a current flow, and that's plus and that's minus. And let me do this, change this to blue, and if I, during the other half of our cycle, where this is negative and this is positive, my current will flow out, it will flow through this diode, and out here, and it's, again, plus and minus, it's flowing the same, same direction as it did before through our load, and it comes back here, and it flows through this diode here instead of the other one, and then goes back to our source. So the current on this side flows both directions. The current on this side only flows in one direction because we have that square. So we end up taking our AC in blue and creating this pulsating DC where we've got every half cycle flowing, but they all essentially just turn the direction around because we've changed the way it flows through this little diode bridge in the middle. Okay? So that's a bridge rectifier. Those are very common for converting AC to DC. And we'll, we'll talk about in a couple of slides how we would clean up those pulses. Uh, I mentioned Zener diodes. Basically, the Zener diode has a steep breakdown curve, a well-defined breakdown voltage, Vz, and so it can hold a constant voltage across a range of current, and we can model it as a device having two parallel branches. Forward biased, um, it's pretty much like a normal diode where we have essentially the, the current that acts like a switch, there is a little resistance in the diode, and we have our, our uh, forward bias voltage. So we don't normally operate Zeners in that region. But what we will do is when we um, reverse bias them, uh, once I've overcome this Zener voltage, there is a little resistance, and it'll flow there. And this, this resistance is small. And we'll will essentially maintain a constant voltage between here and here because it'll just flow more and more current as we try to raise that voltage. Um, you know, and these, these Zener voltages, you can get them 5 volts, 10 volts, whatever. There's a huge range that you can get. So if we put that into a circuit here as a voltage regulator, um, I've got a voltage source. I've got some resistance here in my voltage source, and that we'll use that to limit our current to the Zener diode. And we have the Zener diode connected reverse bias from here to here. So if this voltage here, I call it VI, if that gets above that Zener voltage, the Zener will start to flow that way and essentially clamp or hold that voltage at that at that value of Vz, and then we have some current through our load. So, oops. So we have our unregulated source on the left, our voltage regulator, 
and the load voltage is going to be equal to Zener, the Zener voltage if the diode is in the reverse breakdown region. So we can write this here as um, the current through our load is this Zener voltage, which is the regulated voltage, divided by the resistance of the load um, from Kirchhoff's current law, I can look at the current through the load, the source, and through the Zener diode it, at a node here, and I can come up with this. So a more, I think a better way to write it is IZ equals IS minus IL, because IZ, the current through that Zener, is what we need to be careful to limit so we don't blow out that um, diode. Source current IS I can re the, is going to be basically the source voltage minus the Zener voltage over this resistance. So that's just Ohm's law applied to that resistor that tells us what the source voltage is. And I can rearrange that to figure out what the Zener current has to be by substituting this into, into these up here. And I get I Zener equals Vs minus Vz over Rs minus IL. So what I'm going to do is, given my ex expectation for the, that's supposed to be a minus in there, it doesn't look like it. There we go. Given my expectations for the current to the load, um, I know this Zener voltage here. I've got um, some voltage source, unreg unregulated voltage source. I know what the maximum value is going to be for that. So I can calculate what resistor I need to keep the current through that Zener under control. And basically the Zener diode is rated by maximum allowable power, where IZ max times the Zener voltage gives us the maximum power it can dissipate without overheating and desmoking. So we need to make sure that IZ does not become too large, so we do that by selecting the appropriate value of that resistor to limit that current there. Other diode applications. Diode peak detector. Basically what's going to happen is when the this diode is forward biased, current will flow and current will charge this capacitor here. When the diode is reversed biased, the current does not flow, and the capacitor, if, if there was no load on V out, the capacitor would just hold the charge. There's, if we assume there's some, some load here, the capacitor will slowly discharge through the, through the load, and then in the next cycle on V in, it'll charge back up. So if we look at the signal here to the right, where this is our V in, where we have these pulses of various magnitudes, my output, a charge at capacitor, my output is going to rise up as that capacitor charges, and then when there's no current flowing because the diode's blocking it, that capacitor will slowly discharge the load, charge back up, discharge, and essentially it will find these peaks, okay? And depending upon how quickly, how, how high or low our load is, you know, this could actually hold for quite a while. So we can find the peaks of our input voltage. Diode limiter, um, we have essentially diodes and some voltage source applied here. So if, if this is, this would be plus and this would be minus on that case, in this case, and this would be minus and this is plus. So when the voltage here exceeds this VM, this bias voltage plus the break, the forward bias voltage of the, of the diode, the current will just flow like this and will limit our voltage to whatever um, VM plus that um, forward bias so will essentially limit the voltage that way. On the negative voltage, the opposite happens. At some point, we'll limit the voltage to that number there, kind of like the way the Zener diode worked, except now it's working in both directions. So you can see our voltage output in red 
is going to just be limited and clipped by, by those limits. A bias diode clamp. These get weird. Um, what's going to happen is when, when this, this voltage here is higher than that VDC, okay, plus the forward bias on the, on the diode, current is going to flow and it's going to charge up this capacitor to some voltage, okay? And when, as, and when the, um, you know, obviously when this voltage drops below that, that VDC, um, you, you get, you don't get current flowing. But as you build this charge on this capacitor through cycles, it essentially takes your signal, um, which may be an AC signal, and biases it, and you end up with a, a voltage now that is actually some average value higher than, it, than the input voltage, because as you go through, you know, Kirchhoff's voltage law, you have Vn plus Vc. You've built this bias up by charging this capacitor, okay? Um, so they're a little bit weird, but, but there's the equations for them. And uh, they have their uses. <laughs> so let's walk through a DC power supply. Now, in all these, there will be a, a blue line representing our input volt, or our input, well, it's not in that first picture, but our output of each stage. What we're going to see here is that yellow AC. We can go through a transformer and change the voltage. You could go either way, really, step up or step down. So that's the input to the transformer is the blue line, and that yellow line is the output of the transformer um, down here where it's some different voltage. It, typically, if you're you know, charging your laptop from a 110 outlet in the, uh, plugged into the wall, you're going to step down from the 110 to... 10, 12, 20 volts, something, whatever, okay? Now, I want DC, because the DC, direct current power supply, so I'm going to run it through my bridge rectifier, and you remember the bridge rectifier can conduct basically in, in you know, two directions, and I'm going to mess up the drawing. We already did that, so I won't repeat that. But it will take that full wave AC in and give you this full wave rectified DC out. There's a little bit of a voltage drop there, but now I have this pulsating DC. Um, I don't want pulsations. I want a nice constant voltage. So the first thing I'll do is I'll put it through a low pass filter with a resistor and a capacitor and a time constant of that filter is, is the resistance times the capacitance, right? So click. So I'll take that pulsations and we'll kind of average it out right down here. It's still pulsating some, but it's flatter. And now I can take this voltage regulator, which is going to be set to a voltage somewhere here or lower. And it takes that, that ripply DC and gives me a pretty flat DC output here. And that's what goes to our load is a fairly clean DC signal. And we, you know, quite frankly, we typically put a capacitor here to help absorb any, un, any additional ripple and a source current if the load current changes rapidly faster than this regulator can react, you know, it'll pull current out of that, that uh, capacitor temporarily too as well. But that's a kind of a typical uh, linear DC power supply. Another application for diodes is light emitting diodes. Basically, when when you're forward biased and as those electrons cross that that barrier, um, you kick some photons out. Typically, voltage drop across an LED is one and a half to two and a half volts. It's a higher voltage than the um, than a typical silicon diode, but it's doing more stuff, right? Um, what you don't want to do is have too much current through it and burn it out. 
So you typically put in a current limiting resistor. Um, it says here 330 ohms or 5 volt source. Don't go by that. Okay, uh, figure it out. For your LED, because different LEDs have different forward uh, voltages and they have different rated currents. So, oops, one too many. So if we were to take an example here, um, you know, no current flowing, okay, close that switch, now I'm, I got, ooh, I got light. But if we make this, for, for as an example, make this a 9 volt source, I just looked at one of the LEDs I have in the drawer here, and it's spec to give be 20 milliamps at 2 volts. So I don't want to exceed 20 milliamps. I don't want to exceed 2 volts. Now, I know that if, if I have 2 volts here from Kirchhoff's current or voltage law, I have 9 volts there, 2 volts there. I need to drop 7 volts across that resistor to get everything to balance out. If I have 7 volts across that resistor and I have 20 milliamps of current is my target current um, from Ohm's law, I equals V over R, I can rearrange that, say, um, R equals V over I, and I know the voltage drop I want, 7, and I know the current that I want through that, 0.02, and in this case, I come up with about 350 ohms would be the resistance there to give me the current I want at the voltage I want at that LED. And to be safe, I might, you know, might go a little bit bigger than 350, and I probably don't have a resistor that's exactly 350, so I'll go to the next highest resistance that I have, and everything will be just fine. Getting bored yet? Because this is the last slide. We're almost done. <laughs> um, photodiodes kind of work in the opposite direction, and really this was how transistors were discovered um, when they, in Bell Labs there were, uh, I forgot the guy's name, I should have written it down, um, was working with some silicone crystals, and he had a defective one, it had a crack, but he noticed that when light shined into the crack, it would it would start conducting, and then that's the principle of the photodiode that the photons are able to kick electrons free, so they can cross that um, that that dio the barrier voltage, um, even when it, even when it's reverse biased. But but actually, that led to the transistor that discovery. So obviously, if there's light shining on it, and we have it reversed biased. It can it can flow, um, and if there's if it's in the dark, then there's no flow. Okay, so we can determine if there's light present above some some threshold or not. And obviously, we need a, a voltage source in here. Uh, uh, commonly, they're used in opto isolators or opto couplers or even um, uh, fiber optic cables. You have an input that fires an LED, and they're either you know mounted in close proximity for if it's just a I isolator. If you have uh, fiber optic stuff, they may be separated by long distance by a fiber optic cable. And your output here is that photodiode that reacts to the light being generated by that LED. And now we've done a electrical signal to electrical signal with no direct electrical connection between the two. So we can isolate different circuits um, electrically, and we can also use the fiber optics to transmit those signals across the long distance using light instead of electricity. Okay, that wraps up this one. I don't know how long I took. I didn't time it. Hopefully it wasn't too long. And enjoy the rest of your day.